Welcome to BizTech's Leadership Conversation Show. Today we feature Steve Kalea. He's the founder and executive chairman of the Charitable Foundation uh, and the Institute for Economics and Peace. Now headquartered in Sydney, the Institute of Economics and Peace has grown into a global operation with offices in New York, Mexico, and Brussels. Its research has significant media impact. This leadership conversation is centered around the 17th edition of the Global Peace Index, recently launched by the Institute for Economics and Peace. Now we delve into its key findings and implications of this report. Now to tell us a little bit more, Steve, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me on, Brian. Now, Steve, for a start, could you give us an overview of the Institute of Economics and Peace and the Global Peace Index? Sure. So the Institute for Economics and Peace was set up to understand the intersection between business, peace and economics, put special emphasis on metrics to measure peace, and then ascribe an economic value to changes in peace. And as you mentioned, we're headquartered here in Australia. We have a number of leading products that they include the Global Peace Index, Global Terrorism Index, and the Ecological Threat Report. Last year, I think we had 47 billion media impressions globally from about 24,000 different articles. We work extensively with all the major multilaterals and do research for them as well. That's many different entities in the UN, uh, World Bank, Commonwealth Secretariat, OECD, to name some, and the work's included in thousands, if not tens of thousands of university courses around the world. So the Global Peace Index, it was first established 17 years ago, and it's got three different domains which it uses to measure peacefulness. The first is militarization, the second is ongoing conflict, and the third is internal measures of safety and security within the country. And those three composite parts are brought together. They consist of 23 indicators which create the Global Peace Index, which today is seen as the world's leading measure of global peacefulness. Now, Steve, you made your money in technology. Now, what inspired you to get into philanthropy at the start, obviously, and then this now focus and promotion of peace as a clause, as a cause globally? Yeah, well, a lot of Life's a journey, you know, Brian. Like, if I go back and look at it, the sort of, I developed a computer program at one stage, and I was going to use it in the early 80s as a calling card to head up a research group in Silicon Valley for the uh, yeah, company I was working for. And then I thought, and had a couple of circumstances in my life, said, well, maybe I could go and sell this and make some money. So being rather young, 31 at the time, uh, and slightly naive. So I just thought hey, it'd be <laughs> easy to go out and sell three or four copies of this and they'll be able to pay the mortgage off the house. That's how it all started. And so the first company sort of was a, a global success. It ended up publicly listed on NASDAQ and its customer base at that stage was the most critical computer systems in the world. So it's people like the New York, London, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, major international switches for Visa, American Express, MasterCard. They used to hunt down problems in the computers and fix them before they'd interfere with the service. So it's really high tech of tech stuff for those days. Not so much today because we've moved on to artificial intelligence rather than the internals of operating systems. But that's how I made my money. And then I set another company up, ended up publicly listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. And it also worked in a similar vein around monitoring the internals of computer systems. And so I made quite a bit of money out of that. So I decided to set up a foundation to work with the poorest of the poor. And so that's been quite successful. We've done about 240 projects now, about 3.7 million direct beneficiaries. And that's not a marketing number, that's a real number. And that's a so, lot of people. That's a yeah, lot. It's of a lot. It's like, I must admit, it's a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really happy with the impact it's had now. And so what I didn't realize when I did it, the poorest of the poor live in war zones or near post war zones. And we can come back to that later uh, in the interview, if you like. And so I ended up spending time in these war zones or near-post war zones. And then 
this is again, this is an entrepreneurial story because great entrepreneurial stories always happen by accident, I think, Brian. And so what happened was I was in Northeast Kabul in the Congo, now looking at some projects there. And it was, it's one of the more violent places in the world. I suddenly started to think what are the most peaceful nations in the world? Search the internet, couldn't find a thing. And so I got back to Sydney and then so I had a friend who ran the Peace and Conflict Centre at Sydney University, met with him, asked him whether he knew anything and couldn't find anything. And that's how the Global Peace Index was born. So at that stage then, uh, I hired the Economist Intelligence Unit, part of the Economist Group in London, to do the first one. But this poses really profound and fundamental question. So a simple businessman such as myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations and it hasn't been done, then how much do we actually know about peace? If you can't measure it, can you truly understand it? If you can't measure it, how do you even know whether your actions are helping you or hindering in achieving your results? You don't. And Steve, you take a very unique lens to that, a very technology lens to that because normally it comes from a socio-political lens which measurement is not the primary primary equation. Whereas from, from a technology standpoint, it's all about numbers and data. Exactly, see so my background started off as a computer programmer. So I think in numbers and what I found is I was starting to look at peace and you probably find this with a lot of your audience. It, they see it as being something which is fluffy, something which is idealistic, something which really can't be achieved. And it's true, the world will never end up 100% peaceful, certainly not in our lifetimes anyway, or our children's lifetimes or grandchildren's lifetimes. But we can imagine a world which is 10% more peaceful. And that has not only an impact humanitarian impact on people's uh, happiness and, and relieving a lot of suffering but it also has a lot of economic advantages as well and i think with the business background that was the other thing that when most business people get it if you increase peace then you're more likely to improve the environments for business as well and so what i could see then is this relationship between conflict and peace and there's all sorts of the uh, angles we can go off that broad. And, and here's the interesting dilemma, right? Businesses understand that peace is actually profitable. But from a governmental standpoint, obviously, and you talked about the Congo. So that has been conflict ridden for decades, simply because of the vast mineral resources uh, particularly diamonds and conflict diamonds and the trade around that. Um, what have you seen in a disruptive environment like that uh, and, and its impact on people and how have you helped the people in those in a country like the Congo? Yeah, well, it comes back to this, all sorts of different interactions you can do. So you can come in and do basic aid, for example. So like, just we're doing a lot of starvation relief in different parts of the world at the moment. That's temporary. Doing a lot of work on ecological restoration, particularly in Africa of uh, areas which have been economic, been uh, ecologically uh, 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 ruined. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work around uh, 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 stock, improving stock yields from the various different uh, uh, activities with people are doing with farming or with herding and such. So you can do all those kind of things which you can actually improve the people's life. But a lot of the bigger things come back to uh, the bigger geopolitical aspects. And so if we come and look at, let's say, resources is where you started. Some of the more peaceful and richer countries in the world are very, very high on resources. Think of Canada, think of Australia. So what separates Canada and Australia from the DRC? It comes back to the qualities of which make for a peaceful society. We call that positive peace. And that comes back to a whole series of different things. So what we've done, we've got about 50,000 different data sets in here. So we've done a whole lot of mathematical modeling, statistical analysis to understand the qualities which are most associated with highly peaceful societies, what creates peace in other words. 
And so they're things, none of them are counterintuitive. They're things like well-functioning government, strong business environment, equitable distribution of resources. That doesn't mean equal. It means that the social contract, so the different groups within the society feel like they're included. It's a free flow of information. We'll come back to that. It's a high levels of human capital uh, and good relationships with neighbours, low levels of corruption. And so these things come together as a system. Now, the same things which create peace create for a thriving economic environment. So now you've got the ability now to equate improvements in the background conditions which create peace or actually an actual peace. And you've also get this very, very strong correlations with higher uh, uh, GDP growth and a whole range of other macroeconomic conditions. So just give you an idea, if we took the countries which are increasing the most, this concept called positive peace or peace if you like, and we compared the growth in their GDPs to the global average over the last decade, it's 34% higher. Now that's an investment proposition. That's an investment proposition. You find that countries which are improving and these qualities which create the underlying peace uh, have three times higher foreign direct investment. You find that the inflation rates are lower as of both obviously the interest rates, the inflation rates are about seven times less volatile. You'll find that the foreign exchange increases over time, the foreign debt ratings improve as well, like that's through MSCI and Moody's and others. So there's this strong virtuous relationship between peace and economic development, which obviously then flows into business. And Steve, I want to use one country as an example to highlight all the things that you just said, Rwanda. And, and literally, if, if, you, if we think about it, and, and maybe you have some specific thoughts on that, they are an epitome of a country that was in serious conflict and has now undergone a transformation because of all the issues that and, and all the attributes that you talked about. Yeah, look, that's true. So if we look at, let's say, peace in 2022, uh, so there was the largest number of conflict deaths, uh, battlefield deaths this century. The only, and that, so that was about uh, 240,000. The last time that that was surpassed was with the Rwandan genocide in the 19, 1990s, where you had about 800,000 people killed. So just, so just to put it in perspective, that gives you an idea of just how bad uh, it was. So now we look at it over the years, and you're right. They got, they got the, the, so we look at it today, it's really one of the more peaceful societies in Africa. And if we look at it, we can see just great growth in its GDP growth over the, let's say the last 15 or 20 years. In fact, I was in Rwanda just, gee, it would have been maybe four months ago, only for two days, but it's there for, yeah. And you could see it in the streets, you could see, see it. I could see the changes from the time I'd been there prior, a lot more buildings, in Kilgali, there were a lot more buzzing businesses going. It was, it was good to see. Now, uh, and what you just quoted from is also some of the data that came out of your um, 17th edition of the Global Peace Index. Um, as a leader, what are some key take to, takeaways of the studies that you all have done uh, in this latest edition? So I think We'll stick with the economics first up. So we, one of the things we calculate is the cost of violence in the global economy. It came in at $17.5 trillion. So that's about 13% global GDP. Now, none of us can imagine a world which is totally peaceful, but we could imagine a world which is 10% more peaceful. So that'd be about $1.7 trillion. So that's the equivalent of adding three new countries to the world the size of Ireland, Switzerland, and Denmark. So these are small amounts are substantial. So now if we start to look into, let's say, and I'll, I'll look at the movements over the last decade, and we'll just try and unpack that a bit, rather than we'll just look at the last year, because the last year really was dominated by the Ukraine. 
mm-hmm. and Ethiopia, which was a worse, which is a was a worse conflict than the Ukraine last year, but uh, almost got no coverage. There was a hundred thousand people died in Ethiopia, compared to eighty three thousand in Ukraine. And and you're right. There's almost no coverage of this anywhere in the global media. That's right. Yeah, well, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, but nothing like the coverage of the Ukraine. So we come back and let's look over the last decade. So what we can see is the international conflicts, internationalized conflicts are on the rise. That that means that there are more countries involved in conflicts in other countries than there were. In fact, it's increased from since 2003, which is if we go back, and that's really at the start of the Iraq war, from three countries to 28 now, which are got internationalized conflicts. And so they get, when you get the international conflicts, they get much harder to solve because you've got proxies on either side, which are supporting rival groups and gets very, very difficult. And Sudan is an example of that. Yes, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a very good example, topical at the moment, topical at the yeah. moment. And we could look at Yemen. Uh, we wanted to look further, yeah, we wanted to look further afield. One of the more interesting things, Asia Pacific is the on the improve. If we just looked at one year, what we had was 13 countries improved in peacefulness and only seven deteriorated. So Asia Pacific is actually in a virtual cycle with peace. And you can see the economies in Asia Pacific are also booming. So you've got this interlock, inter, it, you've got this virtuous relationship, I guess, between the two. So if we come back and we look over the last decade, uh, we find the number of levels of violent demonstrations. That's the indicator which deteriorated the most. Followed, the other two which are related is the intensity of internal conflict and the number of conflicts as well. Now they're both off a low base, but they've been increasing each year, which doesn't bode well for the future, let's say. We can find over the last decade, however, that Homicides have dropped globally, as they have been in Singapore. I noted that you see in this year's Global Peace Index, the homicides in Singapore have been improved also. And so that's now, now we go to the what's counterintuitive, and this is really counterintuitive for most people, militarization has decreased in more countries than it's increased. In fact, for every one country which has increased its militarization, two countries have decreased. Now that seems really counterintuitive. And you can see it reflected in military expenditure as a percentage of GDP and in the number of the service personnel. But I suspect, Steve, that that's changed in the last 12 months. I think the issues around Taiwan and a, 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 a report uh, uh, and the blo- uh, potential blockade of Taiwan, the the, the Ukraine-Russian war has basically then up, to, you know, alerted governments of the need to spend more, particularly in Europe. Yeah, when we come, yeah, and that's a very, very good point. Uh, uh, but if we start to look at the nations in Europe, so we cover 163 countries in the Global Peace Index. So it might be 20 nations in Europe which are affected by it, which will be increasing their percentage of GDP on the military. But once the Ukraine war is over, the question is, will they, will they see need to keep on increasing their military expenditure? I don't know. We've, we've, we've looked into this in a lot of detail, and there's no underwriting narrative uh, where you could say that countries like Costa Rica or New Zealand decided to give away the military and become peaceful. What happens more, what seems to be happening, it's just a prioritization of budgets. Because if you haven't got a lot of external threats around you, which let's say Latin America, they're they're riddled with internal conflict, uh, with mainly with the criminal gangs, but they're not fight, Board, they don't have border disputes. So they, you look at the priorities, it'll go to somewhere else. It'll go to like health, might go to education, business stimulus. And so it's not this conscious effort we're going to reduce our military budget. It's just a prioritization. 
And, and Steve, I want to just highlight something that's really close to home, close to you as well. So you think back to Helen Clark and eliminating the, the New Zealand offensive capability of their Air Force. Essentially, that was a budget prioritization, exactly what you said, and that was a redistributor. They don't have natural enemies. And yes, they have a patrolling element in terms of the Air Force and transportation, but not an offensive ability or a defensive. Yeah, so now with for the military, is expenditure on the military good or bad? So it's neither good nor bad. It depends on what, it, what you're using it for. So if you've got some nasty neighbours, you really do need to have adequate defences, which you could argue is, let's say, happening in, in Europe at the moment, and certainly in areas of the Middle East and such. Now, so if you, let's say, you build yourself a aircraft carrier for $20 billion. Now, that's very good investment if it actually keeps you safe. But if you build one aircraft carrier more than what you need, that's $20 billion, which is dead. It doesn't have, doesn't, it's got no productive utilisation, maybe a little bit of spin-off in R&D, things like that, but no productive utilisation. In fact, it's going to cost you maybe half a billion dollars a year to run the thing. Mm -hmm. because you've got your fuel, you've got people you've got to put on board, you've got weapons, which you've got to use every now and again. So now if you took that 20 billion and you invested it in education or in business stimulus packages, you get a much stronger flow on effect through the economy. And that's an example of just the trade-offs you've got. Steve, it's been a fascinating conversation. We could probably talk all day, but we've run out of time. Any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with before we end the conversation? Sure, I'll just leave you with one, which has been going, I'll leave you with two. So the first one's on Taiwan. We've just looked at what would be the economic implications of blockade on Taiwan. And that would come in about the $2.7 trillion, 3% of global GDP. China and Taiwan would be the countries affected the most. Uh, and if you looked at China's five largest trading partners, they're all Western democracies, which are politically aligned. So they're South Korea, Japan, Australia, Germany, and the US. Now, so that's the first thing. So economically, it'd be a disaster for the world. Like you've got a large proportion of the uh, chips, like 92%, of all advanced microchips come out of Taiwan. The last thing I'd like to mention, Brian, so if we come back and we look at modern wars, they're almost unwinnable, even for the most sophisticated military. So we go back, we can see what happened with the Russians in Afghanistan. The Americans then got defeated in Afghanistan. Iraq, we can see how that turned out. We're now watching the Ukraine come to a stalemate. And we're, Syria, We've still got uh, Bashir, who's still running Syria. So modern wars, even for the most advanced militaries, are unwinnable, almost unwinnable. But when you've got a population who don't want you there and they're well resourced. And so this comes with a massive economic cost as well. So we need to look at new ways of being able to develop peace. Yeah. That's the final question. That's the final comment. Thank you very much for taking your time to come on the show. I learned a lot and really enjoyed our conversation. Oh, it's been great. Thanks for having me, Brian. We've been speaking to Steve Kalia. He's the founder and executive chairman of the Charitable Foundation and the Institute of Economics and Peace. I'm Brian Fernandez, and you've been watching and listening to BizTech's Leadership Conversation Show. This interview will be on our website, www.biztech.asia as well as our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in.